Thank you very much, Gerd, for this introduction. Uh, I, I just take the ball from you, uh, Marco, uh, from Colony Cancer, and I uh, want to ask you who today would accept a resection for an adenoma in the colon done in an open fashion in a prophylactic indication. Almost nobody. So I think we are facing, seeing the, uh, this entity of, of IPMNs and cystic neoplasm, we are facing a new spectrum of pancreatic disease where we also have to think about new methods on how to operate these patients. And we have uh, heard some information on parenchyma sparing operations, we have heard some information on uh, split preserving operations, and I will show you that maybe, in for, especially for this collective, we have a new technique, laparoscopic pancreatic surgery, that really is a good option for these patients. So, um, tumors of the pancreatic head uh, are rarely diagnosed and even more rarely resectable. This was the opinion of um, Walter Kausch, who had uh, performed the first Whipple operation many years ago, 100 years ago now. And um, so this um, option, um, we didn't think about pancreatic surgery done laparoscopically at that time, I think. So uh, when we now look at the, um, doesn't work here, okay. At um, our institution, for example, you can see that uh, pancreatic laparoscopic surgery is not for everybody. We can see here, we only do 30% of the patients done laparoscopically in our collective, and not every patient, I think, has a good indication for laparoscopic surgery. When you look here, these are the data from the RecoPunk study that we recently published, and this is center experience, and you still see that pancreatic surgery is, um, is dangerous. You see that the mortality in these high volume centers was a cumulative of 6%, and you also have a very high rate of complications here, pancreatic fistula, relevant pancreatic fistula B and C, 21%, abscesses, 20%, a wound infection, um, surgical site infection, 12%, and also some hemorrhage. So um, the question is in this context, what is the role of laparoscopic pancreatic surgery in this complicated matter? So you see here, there might be some advantages. You have less trauma, you have less pain, you have less complications, maybe. You have a shorter length of stay, and ICU, you have better cosmetics, less hernia, but this does this weight um, the risks of laparoscopic surgery. You have an additional risk by the surgery. You have a, a very high learning curve. You have maybe longer OR times, and you have no oncologic validation yet, and you might have um, higher costs. However, there is a certain collective of patients, as you heard before from Marco, that we are currently operating most of these patients, and I, th I think we do now, in a prophylactic fashion. We need to operate them, but most of the patients are not operated for invasive cancer. So this is not, probably not the ideal candidate for laparoscopic surgery. Here you see a patient with a portal vein invasion and is a very proximate uh, tumor to the arterial. This is a candidate for neoadjuvant therapy, and after neoadjuvant therapy, he might get um, resectable, or you might uh, try a resection, but not laparoscopically. This is not a candidate for a good laparoscopic surgery. I would imagine. It's a patient who probably needs a portal vein resection, and uh, we heard about uh, true invasion and, and uh, adhesion, uh, a little bit about Marco, but I think the, this patient needs an open surgery, a radical open surgery. However, there are uh, some centers, like the Mayo Clinic, and Mike Kendrick is promoting that, and, um, and they do also portal vein resections in uh, laparoscopic um, surgery. This is an image from his publication here in HPB, and you can see here they, they do a very decent um, portal vein resection here implying a graft, and the times of the operation are comparable to our experience in open pancreatic surgery. They have the same operating time, they have the same blood loss, they have, the, uh, they have a very high, this is very surprising, a very high rate of R0 resection in this collective. This is probably too high, um, but uh, the outcome is, is pretty good, and you can push this um, operations also in this field. So I'm more promoting it in the field of the so-called prophylactic pancreatic surgery. However, there are patients uh, that probably can be operated oncologically. So the question on cystic tumors is, um, if we treat those tumors, do we do an overtreatment? Um, if we resect these patients, do you have a risk of endocrine, exocrine insufficiency? The question is, can we preserve the ple a spleen? In which patient could we do that? Um, how is the risk of pancreatic fistula, of morbidity and mortality in these patients? And uh, what is the role for parenchyma sparing operations? 
so I want to shortly go over this because you learned almost most of the information from, from Marco, but um, I want to show you this slide here, and this shows you that the progression of um, IPMNs to pancreatic cancer without worrisome features and without a, a certain size is very slow. So over eight, um, over 10 years, you have a progression in this series here um, of about 8% to cancer. So most of these patients are operated if they have an indication in a prophylactic fashion. Um, this study here from Sauvonnet, from a French group, um, they really um, were addressing the question of how we can do parenchymas um, sparing alternatives for IPMNs. So they developed a whole spectrum, evaluated a whole spectrum of new techniques that you normally would not apply, um, like um, here enucleations or uh, so-called uncinatectomy or central pancreatectomy. And what is astonishing about this series is um, that they really had an indication here uh, that was relevant. They had uh, IPMNs over three centimeters. Most of them had muronorus. Um, they had a, a growth or had symptoms. So they were indications of, of real, um, what we would call uh, true indications for a section of branch duct type EPMN. There was a contraindication, so they did not, if the mural nodules were over five uh, millimeters or they had visible tumors, they were operate oncologically. So they were not included in this series. However, if you include these patients here, you can see here the progression-free survival after localized resection was 100% after one year, and even after 10 years was 76%, and the rate of free operation was only 4% in this collective. So what about uh, laparoscopic distal pancreatic resection? Um, this is probably the most uh, used technique over the world. Mm -hmm. And you can see here uh, a uh, recent meta-analysis that is examining all uh, the series that are, have been published on uh, laparoscopic distal pancreatic resection. There is not a single prospective randomized trial. However, these data show that the OR times are actually pro-laparoscopic surgery. And um, when you look here at the length of stay, in the hospital, this is also pro-laparoscopic surgery. If you look at these in this limited series um, at the uh, resection rate, um, on the next slide, you can see here and the resec uh, next slide. Uh, you can see the resection rates. Then you can see that um, you have a much higher rate of R0 resections in the laparoscopic group, but this is a selection bias. And uh, this shows you again that most of the patients have been operated for uh, non-invasive pancreatic cancer, and the rates of cancer are much lower than in other series. This is the data from the German um, pancreatic registry, which now comprises over 4,000 patients. And you can see here in the comparison of the laparoscopic left side resection uh, versus the open left side resection that there's a clear selection bias. You have uh, a much less number of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma in the laparoscopic group, and you have a much higher rate of uh, neuroendocrine tumors or IPMNs in these groups, and I think that's the right indication for this kind of surgery. So what about um, the spleen preservation, no spleen preservation, and parenchyma uh, of, um, preservation? So if you should always try, if possible, not in an oncologic resection, but in a prophylactic resection to preserve the spleen. Um, you can see here that the major complications, um, if you are not able to preserve the spleen, are much higher, and these are mainly infectious complications. Infectious complications are much higher in patients where you're not able to preserve the spleen in a distal pancreatic resection, for not for oncologic reasons, but for this kind of reasons that I showed you. And what is also astonishing that um, the laparoscopic resections, in the laparoscopic resection, the, the rate of spleen preservation, this is shows you this slide here, is much higher than in open surgery. And I will show you a short video uh, where you can really see that um, you have a very good visibility during laparoscopy that you're not having uh, during open surgery. And the spleen preservation, who all, uh, all of you know, in open surgery can be very hazardous uh, to really see the vein and the artery and to clip all the small ducts from the uh, small arteries from the vein and the artery. And I think that's the reason why probably you have a higher rate of screen, screen preservation in laparoscopic studies. What about parenchyma sparing operations? You can see here. Um, it's worthwhile doing it because here you have um, a series that we're comparing central pancreatectomy versus distal pancreatectomy. And you can see here that in the central pancreatectomy group, the patients had only 5% de novo diabetes, whereas in the 
distal pancreatic uh, resection group 35% de novo diabetes. And also this is the weight after surgery. You see that there's a weight loss about 7 or 8% in the distal resection, whereas in the, after central resection these patients gain again weight and do not have a permanent weight loss over two years after surgery. So there are, in the systematic review, several reasons why you should choose laparoscopic surgery. There's less blood loss, less hospital stay, the complication rate is uh, lower, the wound infection rate is lower. However, these reasons here, mortality, morbidity, are pretty much the same after laparoscopic and open surgery for distal pancreatic resection. So what about the length of stay? This is a, uh, uh, from the German database again. There are 10 days laparoscopic group against 14 days in the open group. So also these results can be reproduced in, the, in this experience with over 4,000 patients that we have the same reduction. These are not competitive for US data, but for Germany, I think that's, um, you can see this a shorter length of stay. So to sum up the, um, the uh, current meta-analysis, these are all meta-analysis that have been performed. You can see here, length of stay is one thing and spleen preservation is the second thing. These are the possible advantages of the operation. So I want to show you only one video. Um, there are different techniques of speed preservation. I think the most uh, important one uh, is the Kimura technique where you really preserve uh, the artery and the vein. And um, there are some troubles with the washer technique where you cut the artery and the vein and just leave the um, perfusion via the short gastric vessels. However, um, this is a, a pretty good technique. And here you can see in the video, maybe you can start it, this is a young patient, 40-year-old uh, female with a mucinous cystic neoplasm in the pancreatic tail. And this is an ideal case, I think, um, according to the European guidelines, where you can do a limited resection. This patient, she had no signs of malignancy. So we do now here a very limited paradigm sparing and spleen preserving uh, resection. And um, first, we always go from the lower border of the pancreas to the vein. We show the vein here, then we mobilize the vein over some centimeters. Pancreas is in the upper part of the, of the video. Then we use a lot of bipolar scissors. We can do a limited lymphalnectomy here, which is not necessary in this case, but it's, we need to do it to see the artery in the vein. Then we prepare the vein for some centimeters in the back. You can see the spleen, which is very well perfused. <coughs> and we use this gold finger to define the resection margins to another ultrasound, probably. And then we use a stapler, which is covered with a seam guard here to prevent bleeding from the <coughs> pancreas. And we do a very limited resection of the pancreas and this patient has, is almost losing no healthy parenchyma. As you can see here. And then we just remove this via a small uh, incision. This clips another way here. Okay, you can go on, please. So this is ideal, I think, for this kind of uh, indication. You just do a very parenchyma sparing, spleen preserving operation. There's no problem with the patient if she goes home after a short time if she doesn't develop a fistula. So um, what about the oncologic results? Um, so far, we have only retrospective studies. And what you can see in the retrospective studies is that the lymph node count is the same. The local radicality, uh, radicality is the same. However, I showed you before, there's a very high selection of cases. You have many of these patients are selected uh, due to the smaller tumors or not a high number of uh, really invasive ductal adenocarcinoma. But there are some series that show uh, oncologic follow-up. Um, next slide, please. Next, next slide. Um, where you can see um, here from the German database, these are the lymph nodes harvested in these patients. You can see here. The range of lymph nodes in these patients is um, pretty much the same like in open surgery. The resection margins are pretty much the same. And what is really uh, astonishing here that we have a pretty high um, rate of uh, T3 cancers in the, in the database from, from Germany. So um, it's moving towards also resection of pancreatic T3. 
cancer. These are, this is the only study that is a comparative study for the oncologic results published in JAMA in 2013 and they show that in this study they have the same results as far as survival for open and minimal invasive surgery in the uh, laparoscopic distal resection only for adenocarcinoma. So what can we sum up for distal pancreatic resection in laparoscopy? There's a higher rate of spleen preservation and organ sparing techniques. Laparoscopy has uh, so far shown comparable results. Laparoscopy shows more spleen preservation, more parenchyma preservation, less complications, and but the same fistula rate. And laparoscopy should therefore be preferred um, as technique if established in the center. So the next question is about, about pancreatic head resection. What about laparoscopic vipal resection? Um, this is a more um, difficult field, I think. Um, even though if you look at the literature now published over the last years, you can see here that there's a tremendous increase in publications over the last years, and it's even going further uh, now. And also, but what is really important is this uh, part of the slide here. And you can see that the number of resections uh, published in these series are, in the majority of cases, very low, one to 10 cases. And there are only a few centers that have 60 or 70 cases published um, and have a high experience in laparoscopic pancreatic head resection. And so far, and, and this is important, and I will tell you in a, in a while why this is important. So we have, um, at that time, we have looked at the uh, rate of uh, radicality and lymph nodes in laparoscopic pancreatic head resection, and they were all publications published over 20 cases. Um, and you can see here that the R0 resection rate is very high. It's around 80 to 90 to 100%, which also shows you again that this is a very limited uh, oncologic experience, only um, mainly IPMNs or prenets in the pancreatic head. Lymph node um, the count is comparable, and the morbidity and the mortality rates on the next slide, you can see here, are as comparable to open surgery in centers. So what about uh, um, how we do approach this? This is a patient that we did a total laparoscopic um, pancreatic head resection. We now have done over 100 resections of this kind, and you have to apply the same principles. Here you see the um, the mesenteric artery, and you see the, um, um, the vein here, the portal vein, and you have to apply, of course, the same proximity to the vessel as you do it in open surgery. You have to use the same oncologic results in resection, and then you can, I think, also use it in pancreatic cancer, inexperienced centers. And I will show you in a while why this is important that you really gain experience in this, and I showed you that only 30% in our collective are really suitable for this kind of, of operation because we have around 18% uh, portal vein resection in our collective. So this is the patient then. Um, this is the OR time at, for this patient, 400 minutes, long time. So uh, now we are with the OR time in the average about 310 minutes. I'll show you in a while our experience after the learning curve. And I said there are no problems in the postoperative course. This is the scar where we took out the pancreatic head. And uh, this is the result for, from a staging um, CT after six months. And you can see here, this is the pancreas, which is now in the stomach. We prefer pancreatogastrostomy for reconstruction and laparoscopy because it's much easier. And it has very good results, as we could show in the Recopunk trial. What about pancreatogastrostomy? Some information about this. Here you can see. Um, it was striking in our study uh, after the 12 months visit. Um, we had here uh, in the pancreatogastrostomy group um, a lower rate. However, this was not significant, but it was 10% lower enzyme replacement. And we will now go back to these patients after five years and look whether we have endocrine or exocrine differences in the pancreatogastrostomy or chechnostomy group um, as far as. This, this is important, especially for this indication that we are using, because as I told you before, we are mostly operating these patients prophylactic, and they have a very long time survival. So it's important to look at these parameters of exocrine and endocrine function. Um, so these are our first experience from our learning curve. And we could see here that there were no differences in open and laparoscopic group as far as lymph nodes and lymph node ratio the same. And we looked at the, um, at the resection margins. This showed you a negative resection margin of 86%. We 
which also shows you that there's a selection in these patients. We had a lot of uh, patients in there with um, neuroendocrine tumors in this collective. We also learned, this is our first 40 ripples that we did, um, and you can see here from the first 20 to the next 20, um, we um, found we limited our the size of the tumor. Here you can see the tumor size was going down from 25 in average to 12. So we had only operated smaller tumors. The reason was that we had a very high conversion rate in the, especially in those patients where we did the portal vein resection. So we decide this upfront now, um, and uh, I think that's the better better way to do it. You can see this here as well. You see that we have a soft pancreas, and that's a problem in 90% of the patients in the second learning curve by selection. Whereas here uh, we had a hard pancreas, which is difficult for the anastomosis and also shows you that there was a high number of IPMNs or, or other indications that normally go along with a soft pancreas. However, the operation time now went down to 313 minutes in average and you can do a laparoscopic wiggle in 212 minutes. We have been talking about that yesterday, but um, not the normal time is, is around six hours. Um, what about intraoperative transfusion? The transfusion rate here, um, and that's the same results that every series shows you for laparoscopy, not only in pancreatic cancer, but also in colon cancer and other entities, the transfusion rate is lower in the laparoscopic group, and the length of stay is also, however here not significant, lower in the laparoscopic group. Um, there were no differences in pancreatic fistula, no differences in the complications in the Clavendindo classification, this is not surprising. I mean, uh, we are actually we are more uh, cautious about an increased um, complication rate in the laparoscopic group, but we did not face this. Um, some words of caution. Um, the mortality rate after pancreatectomy in high volume centers is around two to five percent. And however, you all know the Bergmeier data or other data from other continents or, or countries um, that have shown the same. If you have a low volume hospital, you have a higher rate of mortality. And this mortality rate is, um, and we have now a German study that has been published in the Annals of Surgery, and the overall mortality rate in Germany is 11%, and this is mainly due to mortality in low volume centers. And we really have to think about, about these results. So um, this is again a Bergmeier uh, study. It's not only the hospital, but it's also the, the surgeon and these are very low numbers. I mean, uh, two operations versus four operations per year by a surgeon. This is really a very low volume still, I think, but even there you can see that in pancreatic surgery, the morbidity and mortality goes down if you operate a little bit more in these patients. This is something that actually should not happen, I think. This is a series that has been published in laparoscopic pancreatic head resection. You know, the seven operations uh, over 10 hours uh, on average 350 milliliters of blood loss, length of stay, it's just, just the same, and the readmission rate was 30%, so I think that's not, not, really, um, not really what you should achieve with this kind of surgery. You really should show that it's um, similar or feasible in the same way, and it takes some time. So Kim and others have published a series on only IPMNs uh, for pancreatic head resection from Korea, and they have three-thirds and they look at the learning curve from the first uh, 33 patients to the last 33 patients, and th there is a striking difference after 66 patients. You can see um, that the OR time goes down, the complication rate goes down, and also the length of stay goes down. These were all um, IPMNs, a very low rate of malignancy, only 7%, um, but you see this is important for the learning curve. It needs at least 50 patients to reach adequate number of um, of length of stay and complications. These are some worrisome publications. Um, this has been published in the Annals of Surgery in 2015, and you can see here in this publication that uh, the rate of mortality um, in the minimally invasive group was higher, significantly higher, um, than in the um, open group, and the 30-day mortality here had an odds ratio of 1.87 if done um, laparoscopically compared to open, so 1.87 higher risk of dying from the operation in the laparoscopic group. However, if you look closely at this paper, then you see that 92% of the participating hospitals in this paper had a caseload of less than 10 uh, pancreatic head resections 
over two years, so less than five per year, and this is super low volume, and I, I don't, um, I would not support any uh, hospital who really start this with a very, very low volume, because I showed you in the beginning, if you have 30%, we do 30% laparoscopically, so if 30% of five cases is maybe one, and then you, you are not, cannot be surprised about this data. If you analyze this data in a different way, as has been done um, by this group here, I'll go back please, um, then you can see here that um, if you have more than 10 resections laparoscopically performed per year, then um, these um, data should look different. There's no difference between the laparoscopic and the open group. So on the next slide, uh, you can see here the um, experience again from the Mayo Clinic. This is a very high volume, very experienced group in laparoscopic pancreatic surgery. And um, they look, put out the first oncologic data and you can see here total laparoscopic pancreatic head resection for pancreatic cancer. And these are the data here from the progression-free survival. It was a little bit better in the laparoscopic group. These are the data from the, um, also from the, um, um, okay, this is the same data. Go on, please, next slide. So this is the, um, the what's, what's striking about this study. They looked at the recurrence rate, um, and they found that in the laparoscopic group, even though they had the same, which is not surprising, same number of liver metastases or lung metastases or other um, recurrence, they had a very low, a much lower number of local recurrence as compared to the open group. And that's really striking because um, they had the same indications and they matched their collective as far as the tumor size and other things. So this were the same collective of patients. And it's not really explained in the study why this is, but it's uh, impressive. And also what is striking here is the access to chemotherapy, to adjuvant chemotherapy. And this was higher in the uh, laparoscopic group versus the open group and also earlier or within the time range of eight weeks, mainly due to wound infections and surgical site infections. So there might be a position also in pancreatic cancer where we might draw some benefits from laparoscopic surgery. So uh, to sum up, uh, what is the status of minimal invasive pancreatic surgery in 2016? I think the, uh, so far we are mainly facing selected cases, um, not much adenocarcinoma. The feasibility, however, has been shown also for very complex cases with portal vein resection. You need a very high case volume in the hospital. Uh, you need a high hospital and high surgeon volume. And oncologically, so far, there's no inferiority been shown for laparoscopic surgery, but we need to accompany this with registries because um, there will probably not be a prospective randomized study, maybe in, in the Netherlands soon, but uh, on distal pancreatectomy, but I think registry studies will really be good to safely imply and disseminate this technique. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, great overview. Uh, are there any questions uh, to Professor Keck? Marco? Thank you very much for this uh, fantastic lecture. I have to say also very, very well balanced. I, I couldn't agree more uh, on uh, what you told. I have a question for you um, regarding indication and also small things I would like to say. Codivilla did the first week policy, wasn't it? <laughs> Only, but typical also, joke with German I do yeah, every time. But you the, without reconstruction. Yeah. But no, no, there was a reconstruction, I think. But yeah. anyway, it depends okay. about that. No, the point is, is another one. You spoke regarding uh, spleen preserving pancreatic, distal pancreatectomy for IPMN. So uh, my question is the following. For example, I generally do splenectomy when I operate uh, main duct IPMN in the tail. And I don't do when there when is a branch duct because that's as we saw before, make a difference. When you have main duct, you have a big chance to have cancer there. And then I, I prefer I to do uh, more radical. I would like to know your opinion about that. Um, I agree with that. That's, that's true. I mean, um, there's two reasons for this. Uh, first, if you have a main duct type, if you have a main 
uh, spleen preservation can be very difficult. Uh, normally you have a lot of uh, inflammation around the pancreas and um, it's uh, probably not advisable to do it. A secondary, um, I also think that um, main ductal IPMN should be treated as, um, as potentially oncologic cases and we do oncologic resection in these patients. I agree. Thank you. For further questions? Tobias, what? what? Uh, Tobias, what's, what's about your uh, idea, what is going to be best in the future? Is it more the laparoscopic approach or will it be more the robotic approach? What do you think? I think um, probably for spreading the um, technique of laparoscopic or minimal invasive pancreatic head resection, the robotic approach will have some benefits because um, you have some benefits in suturing. I think that's the main benefit. As far as uh, enlargement or, or three-dimensional vision, this can all be achieved by laparoscopy. However, you need some, uh, you need a high experience of laparoscopic skills to do this operation. So I think probably for the reconstruction phase, the robot will play a role. I don't think it will play a role for the distal resection because it's very easy, very straightforward by laparoscopy, very cheap. And I think there will be no benefit for laparoscopic, but I think for the reconstruction, they are not, not the current robot maybe, but further developments that enable um, combination of laparoscopy and robotic or telematic assisted surgery.